continuing from the, the previous video, uh, we will keep talking about finite element modeling and uh, computational fluid dynamics, focusing on the application, what you can do with it. First, we talk about uh, multiphysics, then uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. We look at use cases, and then we look at uh, the software that you can use for uh, CFD simulation. So what is multiphysics modeling? Multiphysics means using multiple physical models uh, inside a coupled system. So what does coupling mean? Coupling means that certain variables in this uh, system are linked between the different physical models that you use. Yeah, so this is, for instance, uh, a system where uh, you link mechanical modeling, thermal modeling, uh, and electrical modeling together in a, in a coupled system. Uh, this is a multiphysics uh, model where uh, your systems are linked through certain material or, uh, or variables uh, through, through certain phenomena that happen. Uh, for instance, in Zhao heating, which uh, is resistive heating, uh, any uh, uh, conductor that has a current passing through uh, with a finite resistance will generate heat. Uh, and that uh, can, can be modeled with uh, gel heating. There, um, the coupling is through the, the heat source or the heat being generated. So heat being generated by your electrical model and the heat transfer model, they are coupled together through the amount of heat uh, inside the system. That is a coupling. In reality, any kind of problem that you have, even a I don't know, a wheel turning on the ground as a coupled problem. But if we look at uh, something closer to this uh, lecture series, then an exothermic reaction uh, in a flow. So a heater with uh, an exothermic reaction uh, or, a, uh, or a system in which you have an exothermic reaction running in a flow, that's uh, a three times coupled problem. So you have a reaction model which uh, generates heat, which is uh, distributed by the heat transfer equation. But at the same time, another equation, the convection diffusion equation, determines where your uh, chemical species that reacts in this uh, exothermic heating are in space. And the reaction rate is also affected by the temperature of your system. So, some examples. Laminar flow with species transport. This is something you will work with in the lab. Jowl heating. So, that, what this means, laminar flow with species transport, it means we are modeling uh, concentrations of uh, liquids in a, in a convective flow. Uh, conjugate heat transfer, where you have, uh, for instance, a cooling fan where you model fluid flow uh, coupled with heat transfer. And then compressible flow modeling is also a, a multiphysics model. Then uh, talking about computational fluid dynamics. So uh, again, I need to stress, we deal with incompressible flows and uh, we deal with, so, Navier-Stokes equation gives the basis to everything that uh, we talk about. Uh, and we deal with inertial forces, pressure forces, viscous forces, and external forces. In uh, simulations, these are also in. But uh, in our description of uh, the theory, we only talked about these three to keep things simple. But uh, inside your model, you will have external forces as well. So. Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, you might still remember from uh, the first uh, video in this lecture. Um, this is also called uh, the continuity equation. So conservation of mass in time, in space, and uh, inside the convective flow. And conservation of momentum. So this one is the inertial force, pressure force, 
uh, viscous force and external forces, whatever they are. These four things are what define the conservation of momentum in your system. Conservation of mass and momentum. And these take a lot of computational power to solve. So for a one-dimensional system, you can solve it quite simply. For a two-dimensional system, that takes a lot more uh, power because if you have even something as small as this, you discretize to your mesh, uh, do your mesh with a certain step size, you need to solve for every single point these equations if the flow comes from here. So this is your source and uh, this is your sink. You need to solve it for every single point and then for the other points. And then if you do it over time, you need to solve it for every time step again and again for each of the spatial coordinates. So it takes a lot of power. And uh, yeah, laminar flow and turbulent flow models also exist. We will only deal with laminar flow in our course to, to keep things simple. So applications in general, weather models, uh, aerodynamics, and even in injection molding, they use uh, CFD to model the shrinkage of uh, plastics. Species transport. And again, chemical species can mean a lot of different things. Atoms, molecules, ions, microparticles, uh, cells that uh, are subject to chemical processes or a measurement. And these are diluted in a solvent. Small concentration of species, large concentration of uh, solvent. So remember that this is for diluted species. And that's what we will work with, or that's what we work with in our uh, course and in the labs. So what, what does this is the convection diffusion equation up here. Diffusion, you now understand why we had this defined. Diffusion coefficient, the uh, change of uh, concentration, and then our flow field. So convection, Again, particles transported inside the flow, directional or unidirectional flow. Unidirectional meaning there's only one direction, doesn't flow backwards. And diffusion in uh, every direction over time. And uh, what we have here as variables is flow velocity, species concentration, and uh, the diffusion coefficient, these are material properties, they are constant, this one is the variable. And with this you can track concentrations and you can implement reaction models. So, um, oh yes, this one is very important also, the, the reaction rate is defined by the convection diffusion equations, reaction rate depending on the rate constant that you can calculate from the Arrhenius uh, equation, rate constant of your reaction for chemical species A and B. If you have a reaction where A and B are being converted to C. Uh, how does this work? And this is what you will do in the first simulation lab. You first define your geometry. Either you import it or you make it inside your uh, solver software. Then you define the domains. So here's your geometry, domain number one, domain number two. Then uh, you assign physics problems to the domains. In this case both will be laminar flow or single phase laminar flow. Then you assign boundary conditions zero flow, so no slip boundary. Uh, this one is an inlet, this one is an outlet, inlet, outlet, and uh, then you generate a mesh, which looks like this. It's pretty dense to account for the effects, and it is densest in the middle and around uh, these uh, micro pillars. So what you see here is a channel with rectangular micropillars. This is also what you will work with in the lab. 
And then you set up the solver. Uh, in this case, we will do a stationary uh, simulation, so it's not time dependent. And you solve uh, for the flow velocity and pressure. And then what you have here is the pressure distribution and the flow velocity distribution. Obviously, velocity is the highest between the pillars and uh, the lowest after the pillars. And you can also see that there is no there is no turbulence. It flows in a straight, uh, straight uh, laminar or straight laminate, straight layers uh, between the uh, between the, the pillars. So laminar flow, microfluidics, no turbulence. That has a negative effect on mixing. So if you would just have these two flows running next to each other there would be very little mixing. It would all happen through this boundary in the middle. But since we have these uh, micro pillars, they have the effect uh, that you saw uh, on the slide of the Reynolds uh, number that after the micro pillar, the flow lines uh, cross each other just a little because of how uh, the flow goes around uh, these micro pillars. That helps mixing quite a bit. So if you optimize this micropillar geometry, then you can get a better mixing. It's a dumb example, but it is a simple one, and it will be useful for other things. It's quite easy to understand, though. That is why you will work with this in the lab. You can simulate mixing and calculate mixing efficiency. Perfect mixing would be a one-to-one -one ratio. Then you would have uh, a perfect uh, uh, middle ground between the two uh, phases. But instead of that, you have actually an imperfect mixing. So that was use case one. Use case two is heat transfer analysis. Uh, this is part of thermal engineering. I will have one lab for you uh, in this topic. And uh, it covers the generation, use, conversion, and exchange of thermal energy between physical systems. You have four modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, radiation, and transfer with waste change. Conduction is between solids. Convection is in fluids. Radiation is the black body radiation. And uh, transfer with waste change is uh, between different phases, for instance, liquid and vapor. Uh, and it is uh, defined and calculated through the heat transfer equation, which was mentioned uh, before. And if you want to define a thermal system, then you must define a heat source, otherwise you will not get any results. You must also define a heat sink, otherwise you will just get an overheated system. You must define thermal interfaces, interfaces between the various materials in your system, like, for instance, thermal grease. You must define heat losses, all of them, and uh, evaporative means the phase change type of heat loss. You must also define the time constant and the steady state temperature. Uh, actually, this will be what, uh, what you solve for. So if you solve your model in a time-dependent manner, then uh, you will receive, this is a, a thermal transient curve, you will receive the steady state temperature, and you will also define the time constant of the system, which is what it takes to reach the steady state from a state of uh, ambient temperature, from a state of rest. So this is your time constant tau and your steady state temperature T. Uh, what can this be used for? I will only bring you two things. So one is um, to take a look at how much of the reaction chamber is in the correct temperature range. So this would be an example reaction chamber. And inside this reaction chamber, uh, you have 
this portion in the right range, the other uh, portion is outside of your range. What does this tell you? If I have a sensor in reality in the middle and I validated uh, my model against that sensor, I cannot put that sensor anywhere else inside this channel, can only put it in the middle, but I can, from the simulation, get what the temperature is uh, over the other portions of this channel. And by integrating, I can get how much of the percentage is, or how much of the percentage is that is in the right range. This tells me if uh, the reaction will succeed. If you know that uh, 85%, like in our paper, if 85% of your reaction chamber must be in the right range to uh, get your reaction to work, you can get it from, uh, from the simulation when you cannot actually measure uh, something like this. You cannot measure with an infrared camera in a system where your channel is hidden between several layers of, uh, of plastic. If you open it up, it will not work. So in situ, only way is to measure in, in where to, you can put the probe and simulate the rest. Uh, you can also check against user safety uh, standards. So this uh, is a medical uh, electronic standard, uh, the, the, the most basic one, uh, 60601. You must remember this if you're a biomedical engineer, is the one that you always start from. Uh, you can have a surface temperature of, for instance, you know, on a one type of surface, you have a limit of 48 degrees. So you can check if uh, you are in the right, you can check if you are in the right range uh, over the, the surface of your uh, device, over your enclosure. Can it be uh, good enough for, uh, for the standard or will the user be burnt if it is too high? So you can assess compliance with the standard and uh, adjust insulation until you meet the, the correct conditions. And up here, you can also look at where you need extra insulation or where the heater is ineffectual. So by installing a heat spreader, you will now have the right distribution. Electrochemical sensing is also something you can uh, uh, simulate. Um, Electrochemical sensing hinges on uh, redox, so reduction oxidation reactions, typically ferrocyanide to ferricyanide. It is a reversible reaction between these two materials that gives you the base uh, signal. And uh, you can calculate with the domain equation, um, which models the accumulation or uh, depletion of the electrochemical uh, active species, the concentration of which is defined here. This is your diffusion coefficient and, uh, and this is your uh, differentiation in time. So distribution of your concentration in time and uh, in space is uh, what we're talking about here by this domain equation. And then from that you can calculate uh, the electron transfer across the electrode double layer, double layer being the layer between your uh, electrode and your liquid where um, you have a, a polarization. And when a current is produced, that you can measure, but you can also estimate by calculating all of this. And the current determines the, the concentration of your target analyte, for instance, glucose. In situ, how it looks like is uh, this. So the base signal of uh, ferrocyanide, ferricyanide, and, uh, and glucose oxidase, and then ferrocyanide, ferricyanide, glucose oxidase, and glucose, if you have glucose bound. So this is the basis of your glucometer, how it works. There will be a deflection and the amount of the deflection of this uh, uh, electro or this uh, uh, current flux is what uh, tells you the concentration of your uh, um, electroactive species of uh, not, not the electroactive species, sorry, of uh, the target. And uh, this is the method that we have here is called cyclic voltammetry, where uh, you watch the current response to a voltage step usually a very uh, small voltage is what we are talking about from zero to one and then back 
and then uh, you have a, a deflection from uh, zero to uh, to plus eight microamps. So small voltage, small current. That is why you can have a, a portable device. And it is an enzyme mediated reaction. So glucose plus ferrocyanide products plus ferrocyanide is uh, your reaction. And here's a simulation of uh, the current density. Now to, to talk about the software environments that you can use, um, there are commercial and open source options. Open source options are slightly less user friendly uh, in my experience, but even in commercial examples, uh, you have differences in uh, what you can do with it. Two most popular that that I personally know about uh, in this field, in Lebanon chip, are Comsol Multiphysics, and this is what we have the license for in our department, and this is what you will use in the labs. It's uh, quite user-friendly and quite easy to learn until you want to do something that is not implemented in the system. Then it becomes super hard. So if you want to get past the limitations that uh, are in, in this uh, program, then you will have a difficult time. Um, but ANSYS uh, and or Fluent are far more powerful, more uh, geared towards professionals, uh, which means they are more difficult to learn. So that's the, the con. Uh, these uh, software environments can uh, help you build your model. They also have their own uh, uh, CAD uh, software built into them or CAD representation. Uh, built into them into which you can import your model from uh, a CAD software. You can assign domains, you can define uh, physics problems, and you can define boundary conditions and so on, initial values. You can generate a mesh, so they have a, a mesh generator inside, and they also have solvers inside. And after the solution is reached, they have various tools to visualize and uh, evaluate your results. So they are quite powerful tools, which you will see in the lab or labs. Prominent examples are, uh, as I said, the uh, Comsol Multiphysics ANSYS. There are lots of others, but uh, in lab on a chip, these are the most uh, popular, to my knowledge at least. Other examples exist. So finite element analysis tool for MATLAB, for instance, OpenFOAM. OpenFOAM is uh, open source. So it can be freely used by anyone, but there's a longer learning curve. And then others uh, that even I don't know about. Uh, Comsol Multiphysics. It is cross-platform. It uh, is implemented in Java with all, that, all its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it has finite element analysis tool, solver, and uh, the simulation software. And it comes with tools to import your uh, uh, 3D model or 2D model. It has a Java API for MATLAB and, and uh, also other uh, software environments. And the good thing about Comsol is uh, the community. That, uh, they have uh, some, some quite uh, nice support on forums and uh, in, through webinars. If you want to get started, I recommend uh, checking out their webinars and also the, the tutorials and the help files. They are uh, quite informative. And uh, you can look at some animation examples uh, for uh, CFD simulations uh, on these links to, to see how it looks in action. So this is Comsol Multiphysics, what you will work with in the lab. And so for this video, uh, we talked about multiphysics modeling, computational fluid dynamics, some use cases, and simulation software that uh, you can use to, to work with these.